don't like that name, but it's true because they are very visible. I mean, they, you know, they are real injuries. Um, but you know, we call tra traumatic brain injury, traumatic brain injury, we call post-traumatic stress, post-traumatic stress, post stress disorder. And that bothered me. It's not a disorder. It's not a disorder for a young man who sees his best friend killed in an explosion and ends up spending the next, you know, four hours picking up body parts. He got bonked on the head. That's not a disorder to have a reaction to that. It's not a disorder for a woman who's violently sexually assaulted to have, you know, it's not a disorder. It's, it's an injury that occurs. We just don't understand it. it. And, you know, I'll stop so everybody can get something to eat and I'll kind of tell you the journey I'm on. We, um, the, the fact of the matter is when you really get into it, what you find is whenever you have a problem above the neck, it's like going back to the 19th century. <laughs> that's, that's, where, that's where medical science is today. It's right about in the 19th century. We have, we've been fighting these wars for 17 years. We don't have biological diagnostics for traumatic brain injury yet. We don't have them for post-traumatic stress. And because we don't have biological diagnostics, we don't have, we don't have drugs specifically brought to market to take care of these conditions. Mm -hmm. now, the, the problem with the drugs that many of you have been given is they're all off-label prescriptions. They're all drugs that, that went through the FDA for some other problem, and your doctor, who has the authority to do it, is in fact prescribing them to you to control a, to, to help with a symptom that your body may or may not be genetically capable of processing. And, and that's one of the reasons we've had so much trouble with polypharmacy, mm -hmm. is because there are no drugs. So I worked for an organization. I spent four years working in the military, trying to understand it. Spent in every all the free time I could, and now I work for an organization that is promoting um, research into traumatic brain injury, so we can understand it and get biological diagnostics. Mm -hmm. And we, we've had great success. And I'll tell you about that after you get your pizza. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go and grab your food. Buddy. Because it affects different parts of the brain. To control what we do every day. Um, so please, if I say anything that is wow. offensive to you because that's not your experience, it's not my intent to do that in any way whatsoever. I have to talk in broad generalities because uh, I'm trying to get at the problem and um, and understand it great. But let me tell you a little bit about my journey. When I was vice chief of staff in the army. Like I told you, uh, I had this chart put in front of me on the fourth day I was in the job, and I had no idea what traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress was. I knew what my football coach had told me about TBI or concussion. You were just supposed to shake it off and get back in the game. It would be fine. <laughs> uh, I had a Surgeon General at the time who told me, hey, listen, I'm the Surgeon General in the Army. I'm a three-star general. I am one of the best surgeons in the United States Army. I had six concussions playing rugby and it didn't affect me at all. <laughs> um, he said, so why are you spending all this time? And I said, well, Doc, oh, that's the problem with tankers, they just kind of push it. So. Um, <laughs> we're not engineers. Um, he, said, he said, I don't know why you're worried about this. I said, I'm worried about this because we're seeing kids on a Tuesday get a concussion. And they, somebody says, are you okay? They say, yeah, I'm fine. They, they go back on Thursday, get a second concussion. We air medevac them because they cognitively have all kinds of issues to launch stool, and we end up boarding them out of the Army because they can't do their job. They have a second concussion before the first one has even been given an opportunity to heal. I said, that's what I'm concerned. And he said, well, he said, there's just no scientific evidence that shows that, you know, this causes the kind of problems that we're seeing. And I said, well, we're, we're going to dig into this a little bit more. But there, there was a lot of denial in the Army at the time and in the Marine Corps, because the two of us were the ones that were on the ground fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan, about the effect of this. And when you start talking about post-traumatic stress, it was the belief of people that people who were post-traumatic, who had post-traumatic stress, just better suck it up 
and, and you, you know, you can be fine. You, 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 you're not strong people. You need to be stronger, okay? And I saw these numbers that were 36% traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress and 11% lost arms and legs. So I realized that this was going to be an issue. If I flash forward to the end of my four years, it's the vice. Out of a population of about 10,000 were most seriously wounded in 2012, um, we had 60, 67% with post-traumatic stress and traumatic brain injury, and the numbers stayed the same at about 11% with, with lost arms, legs, and multiple limbs. So we've seen a huge increase in the numbers. Because I didn't know anything about them, I went to doctors to learn. And the first experience I had was with post-traumatic stress, which I knew what a concussion kind of was, but I didn't know what post-traumatic stress was. So I went to a doctor and asked, and then that next weekend I went up to Walter Reed and I tried to show off my knowledge to another doctor, and the other doctor said, well, that, that's really not what it is. And I realized that there was this great variance. People couldn't even really describe what they were talking about. When I asked them about, well, how do we diagnose post-traumatic stress? They said, well, we go to a manual called DSM-5, but back then it was DSM-4. We asked 21 questions to someone, and based on their response and a numerical value in a total, we make a determination using our best judgment whether they have post-traumatic stress or not. And I said, well, you don't, you don't, you don't have any diagnostics? You don't have any blood tests you can give somebody? You don't have any imaging you can use? No, we, we, we don't. We don't have any biologically based diagnostics for post-traumatic stress. And the only thing we have for traumatic brain injury is something called the Glasgow Coma Outcome Score. Now some of you are gonna say, oh no, we have MRI, we have this, we have that, we have other things we can use. None of them are FDA approved. Now why do I care about FDA approval? Because I'm worried about insurance. I'm worried about kids, I'm worried about CPT codes, CPT codes are absolutely critical if someone's going to get insurance coverage. And a lot of soldiers are in a situation where if the insurance doesn't cover it, there may be things that doctors are using today in certain locations that they say allow one to know and to um, understand the degree of injury with traumatic brain injury but I promise you they're not FDA approved. And that creates all kinds of issues. It, can, it, it creates issues that uh, are, we, we don't have uniformity in the system, and people who are to lower uh, social economic status cannot get insurance coverage from them. You, you cannot go to a doctor and say, I want an MRI to see the amount of damage. Now, we use CT, okay, we use CT to determine bleeding in the Okay. In other words, if I get in a car accident and I go to the hospital, there is no biological diagnosis or way for me to tell whether I have bleeding unless I take a picture of the brain and see the brain bleeding. Here's where we run into some of the inconsistencies. The doctor's going to ask you a number of questions if you're, if, if you're conscious, okay? Or if you're not, they're going to ask whoever came, brought you in. And they have a protocol designed by lawyers, okay, on whether or not to give you a CT or not. And it errs on the side of giving you a CT. Why? Because the lawyers have gotten involved because they don't want the doctors being having a malpractice suit that if you have internal bleeding in the brain and you don't do a craniotomy in some instances, you know, you're, you're going to die. Um, I can give you an example of, I mean, just how hard it is. Um, and I'm going to give this example to you: is that there is a blood biomarker that's being used to make a determination on whether you or not you need CT that's going through FDA approval right now. Um, and the FDA said, in order for you to get approval, you're going to have to have 120 positive CTs using the same protocol in four different institutions. And in order to get 120 positive CTs using the same protocol in four institutions. you know how many CTs they had to give? 2,000. So in reality, 
what you're doing, the state of the science is so, the protocol is, is, is so inaccurate, yeah. okay, that you're given 1,880 CTs that you really didn't have to get. Now, now that creates a market for CTs, which is another problem. So when you talk about bringing on a blood biomarker that's going to lower the number of CTs, you run up against a whole bunch of folks who are very pleased to do CTs because CTs cost money. Now the problem with CTs is it's not an issue for you or me, because I don't think we have anybody here under the age of 16, but for young children with shaken, you know, baby syndrome, in order to see if there was damage, to, to give them a CT it means you're giving a whole bunch of radiation to a small child and, and that can be problematic. Now, I'm giving you that example as one of the things we run into when we're doing this. You would think that everyone would love to be able to, to lower the number of CTs that are given. But in reality, there are certain people that are winners because you give 1,880 CTs that you don't have to give. Or, so, so, my concern became how do we find biological diagnostics? And I was, I, I was really naive. I believed if you threw money at the problem, the problem would be solved. Okay? Because that's really how we have solved many of the other issues that we've had. We throw a whole bunch of money at the problem. And if you listen to researchers, researchers say, I could fix this if I had more money. As Vice Chief of Staff, I threw $1.7 billion at the treatment of traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress, and I tell you, I can't point to very, very little that advanced the science. It was all underpowered science. It was all given to individual labs. Those individual labs collected data. They wrote papers, and they didn't share their data with anyone. Because that's really the scientific method, okay? And there's nowhere else, for a guy who's a liberal arts major and a soldier, if I had taken 15 cents from the government and buy bubble gum with it for my own edification, okay, and not have been authorized to do that, they'd throw me in jail. So it was hard for me to understand when I was giving this money out because I didn't totally understand that when we give money to a researcher, the data that the researcher collects is that researcher's data. And ever since we passed a law in 1980 called Bay Dole, named after two famous senators, Birch Bay uh, was uh, from Indiana, and everybody knows Bob Dole, okay, from Kansas. Um, they passed a law in 1980 that said, you know what? Um, the government's not good at monetizing IP, intellectual property. So when we give money to universities, we are going to allow them the first crack at using the data to monetize the IP. Does that make sense to you? You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. If, if I find something, right, if the government gives somebody $100 million to do some research, and out of that research comes a discovery, and the individual wants to monetize that discovery, because nothing's going to come to market if somebody can't make some money in our society, okay? Mm. I mean, that's the fact of the matter. You've got to monetize the IP, and there's risk in that. You know, I think this compound cures this. Well, you've got to go through a whole bunch of hoops to do that. You've got to put a whole investment in there. So, you know, so universities, the decision was made in 1980 to give that to universities. And what grew up in universities are something called tech transfer offices. You've got one at MIT, okay? And that's filled with a bunch of lawyers and a bunch of folks who have kind of rules about when you can share your data and when you can't share your data. I happen to believe there, I would love to run a tech transfer office because I can make it successful because I, I really don't think the people who run tech transfer offices understand how medical research works and what you need to do to get something through the FDA so that it can be FDA approved and become a product, but that's another story. But these tech transfer offices make it difficult for researchers who win grants to share their data even if they want to share their data. Uh, whose data is it? Is it the university who provides the researcher, the lab, in order to, to do the research? Or is it the researcher's data? And um, it's, a, it's, it's, it's very, very interesting. I had no idea about these things. Now, because universities 
most of the money that goes into the kind of research that we're talking about for the brain, most of the money um, comes from the National Institute of Health. I was just going to say that name. Okay. About $31 billion. There's other people who are getting into the, into the game right now. One of them's out in my neck of the woods, a guy named Paul Allen. If you, if you get a chance and you want to, 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 to read about a, a totally different model, Paul Allen has a totally different model. Paul Allen and Bill Gates, that's Microsoft, okay? When I left Seattle to be a young second lieutenant in 1973, um, Microsoft didn't even exist. When I came back to Seattle 40 years later, after spending 40 years in the Army, uh, Microsoft owns half the city. They have a huge Redmond campus. Um, kids who are 35 years old are living in the house that I hoped I would live in, but they jacked the price of it up to two and a half million dollars. Seattle has the most expensive real estate in the country, even more in San Francisco today. And Microsoft's a part of that. Amazon's a part of that today, but it's, it's a big tech area, okay? So Paul Allen uh, is interested in music, he's interested in football, he's interested in basketball, and he's interested in the brain. And he set up the Allen Brain Institute. Now it's a totally different business model. It's a business model where Paul Allen says, I'm going to hire the best and the brightest, I'm going to bring them out here, and I don't, I don't care if they publish papers. There's no requirement to publish papers. I want you to put your data online every single week. And Paul Allen funds the research the NIH won't fund. The NIH has a really rough time in funding research that says, I want to model, I want to understand the mouse brain. And one of the things that Paul Allen did was totally do a model of a mouse brain. So it could be used in clinical trials because, you know, animal, that's where, that's where we start basic science. We started in using in, in animals. I've never understood how you can tell when a mouse has depression, but there are researchers who tell you that, <laughs> that you can tell if you, they can tell when a mouse has depression. But Paul Allen says, you know, I, I, I don't care if you publish papers. Papers mean nothing to me. What, me what, what makes a difference to me is that you do good science, that you publish that science, and you make it available for everyone. The NIH would have never funded the science that Allen's doing, the basic fundamental science is costing these huge amounts of money. They have a research budget uh, at the Paul Allen Institute uh, for the study of the brain of $885 million a year. The NIH spends $76 million a year on TBI research. Paul Allen spent wow. $885 million. Uh, Bill Gates is getting into medical research in certain areas. He also requires data sharing plans and the data be published. So, so they're running counter of the way universities work. But, but you got to understand it's a totally different business model. And, and, and you know, it's important to understand that. And they're doing some amazing stuff. Now, I didn't know any of this when I was Vice Chief of Staff in the Army. And when I got out of the Army and I was asked because of the work that I had done in traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress to understand it, we put a protocol in place downrange before the NFL put it that said, basically, Jim Amos and I did that. He was the assistant. Marine Corps Commandant, um, he, he came to my office on the fifth day I was in as vice. He says, we've got a problem. He says, I'm seeing these great Marines get a, get a concussion on Tuesday. They go back. They get a concussion on Thursday. I see them at launch tool, and I'm boarding them out of the Marine Corps. we got to do something about this. We're going to get the best and brightest minds. We pull together all our docs, and all they can do is argue. Because the science just wasn't that good. One had gone to one school, and this was the problem with traumatic brain injury, another gun to another school, and you can't possibly pull guys out of the fight because they have a concussion, because most people recover from a concussion. You know, we got all this argument, so we pulled together 15 of the, of the best and the brightest, a couple from, one from MIT, one from Harvard, all over the country. We sat down for two days, and we put together a protocol that was implemented downrange that basically said, okay, if you're an explosion or anything, that occurs downrange that could cause head trauma, this is what happens. And we identify, now I'll never forget as long as I live, anybody that's within um, 100 meters of an explosion, okay? Anybody that's in a building where an explosion goes off, anybody who loses consciousness because of an explosion, or anybody who's suspected to have head trauma, had to be immediately evaluated for concussion. 
And even if you pop past the cognitive test we had, it was called MACE, it was 30 questions you asked somebody. And if you scored 25 or above, you didn't have a concussion. If you scored 25 or below, you had a concussion. Even if you passed the MACE and had to score 27 points, you had to be held out for 24 hours because sometimes the symptoms of concussion don't appear until up to 24 hours after an individual has trauma. And then, if you fail to pass both of those tests, you have to go to a concussion recovery center that's located in theater. I say for a period of time, because you know the Marines, the Marines do everything right. When they decide they're gonna do something, damn it, they're gonna do it right. The concussion control center in, 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 uh, in Afghanistan, if you were going to get a concussion anywhere in the world and get the most, the best treatment you could possibly get, post-concussive treatment, it was in Afghanistan. The Marine Corps put their heart and soul into making this a multidisciplinary with physical therapy, occupational therapy. I mean, I knew they had taken it seriously when I saw Marines return to their unit after having a concussion with a little needle in their ear because they were getting acupuncture and the gunny, the sergeant, he allowed that to happen because he knew it was helping his Marine, okay? It was the best place in the world to get a concussion and ensure you're gonna get informed medical treatment. Ours was probably the second best in the Army. We, we, don't, we don't do things quite as good as they do in the Marine Corps. We got a little bit more land and you know, area we had more people involved. But it was, it was really a step forward. And we really beat the NFL in putting together a common concussion protocol that went down range. And, and what commanders supported it because they realized that if you allowed people to recover from concussion, that they could return back to their units. That if you did not allow them and they got evacuated to the United States, you never saw them again, nor did you get a replacement. So it really, really worked. So I, I worked at. Um, I signed all the paperwork to do all the research that we were spending this $1.7 billion, but I had no idea how the medical research, you know, how it worked. So when I got out of the Army and I was offered to go to work at one time, I thought if I use my good name and the work that I've been doing to go out and raise large amounts of money and give it to researchers, they'll solve the problem. I did that for about a year and I realized that that's not the problem. The problem is the research ecosystem. Now, it's not the whole research ecosystem. I've told you about the Paul Allen's and the Bill Gates's who are doing things a little bit different, but that's a different business model. They're using their own, they're using their own money. If you want to go into an area where I think is, um, and it's out of necessity, where it's, it, it's, it's much closer to the open science model that I'm advocating, go into the world of genomics. The genomists share data. Why do the genomists share data? because they've got so much data that not even they believe that any one of them could possibly analyze that data. So they work together in teams much better. They, they, they understand team science. And because they understand, ten, understand team science, because they share data, because they work together, because they're not hooked into a single lab at a single university, they go to multi-labs and universities all over the country and over the world, they're making tremendous progress in genomics. The cost of doing a full genome sequence has gone down from $100,000 to do one, down to, I'm trying to raise money, $800 to do um, full genome sequencing on the, on, on the samples that I've got. I was absolutely confounded. I, I had no idea people didn't share data. I had no idea people didn't work together. I, mean, I ran into a great research researcher at the University of California, San Francisco, UCSF. Uh, he's a PH, uh, PH, PH, MD, PhD. I like MD, PhDs much more than I like PhDs. The reason I like MD, PhDs is because MDs take care of patients and they want to help their patients. And when they realize that there's a problem that they can't help their patient, they want to find out a way to help their patient because they're seeing patients every day. And I don't particularly care for I don't like necessarily to work. You gotta to prove to me if you're just a PhD researcher that you really care about the patient. I, 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 was, I was struck by, um, who was the old Superman who fell off the horse? 
Reed. Christopher Reed. Christopher Reed. Did you ever did you ever see the story about him that when he you know he still had he still had folks following him around. <clears throat> he'd fallen off a horse, he you know, he had spinal uh, huge spinal difficulties and he he went into a, a research lab, I think it was here in the Boston area, to see, you know, if they're making progress in, 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 in finding a cure for, for, for the problem he had. And he came out and the press talked to him afterwards and said, well, what did you learn today? He said, I learned that the people that I'm trusted to find a cure for the problem I had had never met a person who has the problem I had. Because they don't treat patients. They, they were coming at it from a sign. And I'm not saying there's anything bad about that. It's just, I'm a very impatient person. I want things now. I want to help people today. I'm not willing to let this take. Mm -hmm. It's already taken way too long, and it's we've spent way too much money. How can we fix the system to make it work today? So I ran this guy named Jeff Manley. When the world crashed in 2008, um, those of us in the Army know because they were looking for what they called shovel-ready shovel projects for TARP money. Remember when President mm -hmm. Obama put all that money out there, and you know he's going to build things and do things. And there was a lot of research. Jeff Manley had his, this idea as a PhD, uh, PhD MD who would treat a lot of patients. He had this idea that you could do a large longitudinal study on traumatic brain injury and begin to understand the biology of it. And so he went to three universities, put together a proposal, turned it in to the TARP people. The TARP people funded him to go in and enroll 500 and and 56 folks with traumatic brain injury at time of injury and followed them for a year. They only, they, they gave him the money based on NIH rules. NIH, he had no money to analyze the data he collected. So he's out in the street looking for ways to go ahead and get money to analyze the data. So he came to me at one line and he says, listen, I've got this great data set, but I need money to analyze. I don't have any money. They didn't give me, they only gave me enough to get the data, not enough to analyze the data. I gave him the money to analyze the data. He analyzed it. He improved his protocol. We worked with the NIH to get him to put $22 million up for a longitudinal study of, of, of traumatic brain injury. He went ahead and competed. He had this body of knowledge from the 556 folks. He had worked through some of the issues. He won the grant. And I went out and raised another $10 million to fill in the holes that the NIH wouldn't pay for. Now, one of the problems you have is that, and, and, and this is where you know you got to give the universities a little bit, of, kind of a little bit of slack. I mean, the University of Washington that I'm very familiar with is, I think, number three in NIH grants. It it is a public land grant university. It used to get 60% of its funding from the state. Today, it gets 6% of its funding from the state. So, if you've cut back on state funding. It's really not a public university anymore. It's really a private university. It, it has to live on tuition, okay, and find other sources of income. And one of the great sources of income is the indirect cost of NIH grants. The NIH puts out 31 billion every year. Universities take anywhere from 50 to 70 percent in indirect costs. And what does that mean? Sir, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but what it means is that if the NIH gives somebody a hundred million dollars to do research, the university takes from that anywhere from 52 million up to 70 million in indirect costs and moves it into the general fund, not only to support you know the labs that those researchers are in, but to support the philosophy department, the political science department, and other departments that don't have important causes. Yeah, yeah. That, 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 that don't generate the income. Okay? And the states pulled back their money. So because of that, there's great arguments that, that, that the NIH gets into on what they should pay because they, they, they rightfully sit there and say, I gave you $100 million and you're not going to curate data. And the university says, well, we don't care if the data is curated. You know, if you want the data curated, you should include that in the grant money, give us $120 million, and we'll take another $10 million away, and then you can go ahead and curate it. So I pay for the things that there's friction between the NIH and the university to pay for that I know are absolutely critical if you're going to take anything to the FDA. 
get FDA approval, get that CPT code that I'm looking for so that people can go to their insurance company and get covered for it. So Manley says, we did three universities before, we're going to start with 12, 12 enrollment sites. He finds 12 different sites, all level one trauma centers across the country. They'll begin enrollment of these 3,000 patients and follow them for a year. Largest study of traumatic brain injury ever done. We looked at all kinds of traumatic brain injury. We're looking at all kinds, mild, moderate, and severe. They are uh, enrolled at these 12 sites. We had 12 sites to start with. The study became so important, it's going to 19 sites. We've got universities joining us, paying their own money to join because they realize that track TBI is going to change the landscape in traumatic brain injury. Uh, and we've got over 100 of the finest researchers working together in team science, sharing their data between level one trauma centers, trying to get at this problem. I paid money to make sure that the common data standards that we're using were CDISC approved. CDISC is the organization um, that the FDA has adopted to say, okay, if you're going to turn it data into us that we're going to analyze and we're going to use to approve whatever it is you're saying that you've proven here, it's got to be in a certain format. CDISC, you can look them up, CDISC is the organization that in fact takes common data elements that have been put together and puts them into the format that the FDA will approve. Uh, I, paid, uh, I, I paid patient stipends uh, and transportation costs. Um, my board almost fired me when I told them I was going to put up a million dollars for patient stipends and transportation costs. Here's the issue. I'm running a longitudinal study. I'm seeing you at the time of injury. The time of injury, you're a captive audience. You want to be helped, okay? And if anybody in your family thinks that you're going to have a long disability with this, they're going to say yes, please enter. enter. Enter the study. I want you to enter. It was wonderful meeting you. Um, the problem is, is when you get the two week, the three month, the six month, the nine month, and the 12 month checkup, if you're feeling good, why do you want to go back to the doctor for two months to have the doctor tell you, boy, this is really improved? But having that knowledge and getting that into our database is absolutely essential to us when you're doing a longitudinal study. So what I was able to do with these patient stipends, I was able to triple the protocol adherence rate for our patients. So in reality, for an investment of $1 million to the now 19 institutions to pay for a small patient stipend plus an Uber comes and picks you up to take you to the doctor, okay? I've been able to triple the protocol adherence rate. So in order to get as much good data as I've got, you would have had to pay $60 million for this study rather than the $22 million that we pay for. Okay? So it's proven to be one of the best investments we ever made. So where are we? I've got nothing to do with this. I'm just trying to apply a little bit of leadership skill that I learned in 40 years in the Army, bring it into the area of medical research and say, you know, listen, Einstein's definition of insanity is, is what, what it seems to be true here. You know, definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and again and expecting a different outcome. And if you're spending a hundred, if, if me alone in the military spent $1.7 billion on traumatic brain injury research and I don't have anything, I better go look at how I'm spending that money. Why, why aren't we making more progress? I know it's a really tough problem, it is for sure, but how can we reorganize this research ecosystem to do that? So where are we? I talked to you about MRI before. Uh, one of the things we did is, is there are three different kinds of magnets in the United States, in the hospitals. If you go to a 3T MRI magnet, you're going to either have a Phillips, a Siemens, or a GE magnet. I don't know what they have at MIT or Harvard or whatever. Probably got a mixture of them. You would think, and an MRI on any one of those machines would be comparable with another MRI. No, they all run on different software that's proprietary to the company. One of the things we did at our enrollment locations is we went around and we harmonized the software between the three different magnets so that we could take, okay, the FDA would accept 
any one of the pictures we took, okay, on any machine in a lot of people's video. First time that's ever been done. Now, now that seems part of the pun, a no-brainer, that somebody would have thought of that a long time before, you know, I sit down with some guys and they indicate to me that's one of the problems. And I say, well, okay, isn't there a way we could, you know, harmonize the software? And they said, well, it probably is. And they went to the three companies and it was the way we could. So we collected, we, we did electronic uh, capture platforms for all, all 19 locations. What is that? It's a simple iPad. And that, that iPad is in every single one of our locations. So when somebody comes in with trauma, head trauma, the questions are asked to in the same order. It's collected in the same way. The data is all HIPAA regulated, goes back into the same database, where we can curate the data and, 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 and make it FDA accepted. So where did that lead us? Let us after three years, and we were at about 1,700 patients, we went to the FDA and we said, we've, we've got two things that we think are um, findings. First of all, we think we, find it, we found an imaging biomarker that allows you to know whether somebody has had head trauma and the degree of head trauma. We can see micro hemorrhages in the brain, and based on where those micro hemorrhages appear, we can not only know whether or not that individual has had a concussion, we know how that concussion is going to affect them because we know what parts of the brain affect different, you know, people in different ways. We know that part of the brain that affects impulsivity. We even know that part of the brain that causes one to go into swearing, you know, after a stroke. You know, people who've never sworn at all wake up from a stroke and just you know, sound worse than the three of us could. You know, <laughs> in the army. We, we, we can see these micro hemorrhages with this form of MRI. We took our data to the FDA. The FDA said turn in an approval packet. We turned in an approval packet. And in uh, April of this year, we got a letter of support from the FDA, and they told us point blank your data is so good, is so compelling, you could start clinical trials today for drugs based on your MRI. Because, now, why is that important? It's important to be able to go to the patient, the patient's family, and say, you know, you have suffered an injury, and this is what you can expect. But even more important is the ability to stratify patient populations. Not to say mild, moderate, and severe, but be able to take, if, if you consider TBI as a gumball machine with all different colors of gumballs, okay, and they're all in the machine, and you turn the crank, you have no idea what color is going to come out and what that color represents. What you can do with this MRI is you can take all those gumballs and you can separate all the red ones, all the green ones, all the yellow ones. And that gives the drug companies, the device companies, and the treatment companies the targets they need to de-risk their ability to come in and either try to stop that, that biology from happening or to reverse or repair that biology that's going on. You understand what I'm saying? I, I'm a liberal arts guy, okay? You guys can say this better than I can say. Uh -huh. In addition to that, we found a blood biomarker. And, and this is what's really exciting. And, and this is kind of why our model's a little bit different. This is called an ISAT. It's been around for 25 years. Some of you who have spent some time in emergency rooms may have seen one. It's a handheld blood analyzer. It has 23 of these chips that go in it that all test for a different condition. They have found 23 blood biomarkers for tests from the neck down. The most famous one, I, I was talking to the doctor and I before, before, before you all arrived, is for old men like me, it's component. You get, you get chest pains, if I get chest pains, all of a sudden you run me over to Harvard Mass General, one of the very first things they're gonna do is take blood out of my arm. They're gonna take the, the put three drops of this chip right here. They're going to stick it in an ice stat in the emergency room. They're going to push a button. And within two minutes, they'll know whether or not there's any troponin in my blood. If there's troponin in my blood, they're going to treat me for a heart attack and do other follow-up tests to further confirm the degree of heart attack I've had. If there's not troponin in my blood, they're going to say, hmm, did he eat any linguine tonight? <laughs> you know? Uh, these chips are all different. There's 23 of them. This is made by a company named Abbott. Okay, it's been, this is the third iteration of it. Uh, it's in emergency rooms all over the country. It's in army hospitals all over the country. 
Um, we found a blood biomarker that appears in the brain after head trauma. Uh, we, our researchers did. They showed it to the FDA. The FDA was excited about it. Abbott said, we'd like to see 300 of your samples. Because we had done this thing to scale, we were able to give them 300 samples. They did the 300 samples that had a rock curve better than troponin. You know what a rock curve is? You guys know what a rock curve is. You know, up to the left is where you want to be. That's specificity. It's not, you know, better than troponin. They said, we want another 900 samples because we're such we're the longest, largest one ever. We gave another 900 samples. The rock curve hell. This is a chip that's been made for the phase three clinical trials for our blood biomarker panel for concussion. We should, within 12 to 18 months, be able to field this chip. Now, think about that. For me, as a former soldier, this is amazing. I can give this to a combat medic. I've got one neurosurgeon in country. I can, if, if, if he's in, if he has head trauma, or she has head trauma, with three drops of blood, I put it on this chip, I stick it in, I know whether or not i got to send him to the one neurosurgeon I got in country, or whether or not they just got shook up a little bit and they haven't had a concussion. Troponin, the, the blood biomarker we have is dialable. The more you see of it, the greater the concussion. In fact, we even can tell whether or not you're CT positive with this blood biomarker, based on the amount of it that's found in your blood. That's huge for a soldier in a place like Afghanistan or Iraq. But just think about it on a football field, or a soccer field, or anywhere. In any emergency room, the ability to make return to play decisions, not based on what day of the week it is, it what city are you in, how many fingers am I holding up, but be able to make it on basic on real biology real is biology. huge. And more importantly than the return to play and getting to the neurosurgeon, is now you have two ways to stratify patient populations. Now you're even de-risking it even more for the uh, drug companies, the device companies, the treatment companies to come in and show that their stuff works or doesn't work. Now you are really de-risking it. So, as budding medical students, if I were to say anything to you, what I hope you will do, I hope you will look at team science. I hope you will be the generation that turns this thing around and says that we're going to do things differently. Jeff Manley is 52 years old. He's been doing this forever. He is an, an, an anachronism in, in, in my age. You know, he grew up in a world where you have to publish papers. The real sad part of this is, as I was telling the, the team before, is that rather than write the papers to appear in the New England Journal of Medicine and Nature and Science uh, in the Journal of Neurotrauma, our folks turned around when the FDA became interested in the data they went on a 16-month work stream to turn in data to the FDA. And believe me, it's not easy to the standards they want to see because they want to help their patients. They did not publish papers. And now they're being told because they haven't published papers, they have nothing to show in the true academic sense of the word for the money that's been invested. In other words, they don't have papers. Now, for a guy like me, I look at him and say, God darn it. Can't you take this to them and show them that what you've done is helping patients? And they tell me point blank, the, the system doesn't work like that. The system doesn't work like that. I'm of the belief it's time to change the system. I, I'm not for blowing it up. I'm just saying we need to come up with an incentive system in medical research that allows people to do research to help the people that they're trying to serve, not to write peer review journal articles that may or may not help anybody. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I'm, I'm an advocate for open science. I'm an advocate for not letting intellectual property get in the way of getting something to use for the patient. Now, if, if, if I was a, a drug company doing this, let's say, and I came upon these blood biomarkers, how, how would I monetize this IP? I, I wouldn't necessarily monetize the IP by going to Abbott and saying, Abbott, you go ahead and invest your money, which they've invested a lot of, to see if what I suspect is true is actually true. They had to go ahead and analyze 1,300 blood samples, okay, in order to get there. They put a whole bunch of man hours into it. We have turned the IP over to them. They've got the ISTAT. 
It's already FDA approved. The only thing I need approved is this chip right here. So we've turned it over to Abbott. We're not going to make a single cent on this. People who are going to make money on this is Abbott. Okay? But I'm willing, and our researchers are willing to forego any money they might make on this because they want to help patients. They want to help patients. And we don't want to put this into a 10 year development cycle. What we want to do is get through the FDA in 12 to 18 months and have this chip approved uh, and have it pop up all over. And the reason we've been able to do that is when we follow the basic principles of open science and look for, for ways to work with the FDA. My, my, my final point to you would be this. You know, in the research world, the FDA gets a bad rap. Um, I, I can't tell you how many researchers I ran into before I got into who said the problem is the FDA, you know, they're too bureaucratic, um, it's too hard to, to, to work with them. You know, um, they are bureaucratic, there's no doubt about it. They're part of a big government, but, but they've got a real job to do, and that's to protect you and me. And, and what I've come to believe that one of the reasons why they are as difficult as they are for researchers to work with is researchers bring, them, bring them big piles of uncurated, bad data and say it proves a certain thing, the FDA looks at it and says it doesn't prove anything and I'm not going to approve X, Y, or Z or whatever you, you've got here. But the problem is just as much in the research side of the house as it is with the FDA. And, and, and I would argue that if you ever get a chance to get into this area, that early on you engage with the FDA, if you ever win a big uh, you know, R01 grant and decide to do work like this, that you early on go to the FDA, ask how can I ensure that the data that I'm collecting is going to meet the standards that you require so that we, in fact, can help the patient together. And, and, and that's the big lesson learned out of this. That when you do that, I think you're going to find that um, you can make a lot of progress a lot quicker. And that's what we're all about is trying to make that progress. Uh, what we want to do is to take this research model we want to have deliverables like this. We want to go to people and say, see if you do it this way, you can really, really hasten the time to, to, to help patients get better because you are um, you're, you're doing things the way things should be done. And, and the problem is the brain is, is so hard that, uh, you know, I know this is the greatest school in the country, MIT is. Uh, I know it is. But the fact of the matter is, not even MIT, not even Harvard, nobody is going to solve these neurodegenerative diseases by themselves. It's going to take a whole bunch of folks, multidisciplinary teams of engineers, ground chemists, all kinds of people working together to understand the brain because it is the, by far the most difficult organ uh, and it makes us who we are. And, and, and that's what we've got to do to, to get at these tough problems. I'll stop there and open it up for any questions you might have. Um, you uh, uh, said uh, there are um, 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 MIT, uh, Harvard, uh, uh, University of uh, Washington. There we have 19. Right. Yeah. Also, you have uh, uh, hospitals like Mass General. Um, what about VA? The VA has not entered into this with us. One of the reasons is, is the VA, I don't, I, I believe the VA only has three level one trauma centers. We have not asked the VA to join us because working with the government is even harder than working with universities. The VA and VA lawyers, because of HIPAA and the way that uh, military, I know this for a fact, I've been in the government, okay? Yeah. The way they look at this is it's, it's very, very difficult to do a large study like this. Uh, a certain portion of, of our patients are in the military, okay? So we get some veterans. But I, but I happen to believe that the, the, the basic work we're doing is gonna help everybody whether it is done in a civilian population or a military population, the fact of the matter is we are enrolling people at the time of their injury. It's impossible in Iraq or Afghanistan to enroll somebody in a, in a clinical study at the time of their injury. 
We, we, we don't have the ability to take blood. We don't have two hours to sit down with them and take personal history. We don't have MRIs in order to do that initial MRI, you know, based on, we, we just don't have the capability to enroll people at time of injury. So that's why we picked chosen to do it this way. Now, these are all the best places in the country to be treated for TBI. But some of the things we're finding are, you know, I don't think it would surprise you guys, but it has surprised us. They're all level one trauma centers that have had to go through accreditation, but less than 55% less than of them provide any follow-up instructions to their patients who come into an emergency room who are CT negative, provide them any instructions on what to look for in symptoms they might have if they don't recover from the concussion. Over 50% of emergency room doctors do not believe concussion can be treated at all. So they don't even screen for concussion. Once, once you get past the hurdle of being CT positive or CT negative, once you're CT negative, they basically, because they've got people who are sick, who are bleeding, who've been shot in the emergency room, send you home without any instructions at all on what to look for. That, that's one of the real crimes. I tell people that if you're going to get a concussion in this country and ensure that you're going to get informed medical follow-up, you better hope it's on an NFL football field on a Sunday afternoon. <laughs> that's the only place that I can promise you 100% that you will go through a protocol that will properly both diagnose and treat you for your concussion in the following day. It's not in level one trauma centers, which is scary to me. Yeah. So, um, thank you for the information. Um, I'm really excited to see what uh, comes out after in commercial uh, situations. However, I'm thinking about drugs that target TBIs. Have you partnered with anybody who's going to do studies on potential drug candidates? Um, have anybody reached out to you? Our companies, they won't start until we get an FDA approval package. And the FDA looked at us and said, your data is so good that you can start clinical trials right now. But the drug companies, because the, you know, it's such an investment. What is it, $2 billion to take a drug to the market? Okay, that's, I think that's about what it is. They've been burnt so many times in this particular area because you know, they have no biological diagnostic. The, the most famous one is PROTECT which was, was found right here in, in, in Boston. And bring them, bring them, bring them here, right? Yeah. A bunch of nurses noticed women who were sexually assaulted um, and had head trauma, no, women who had head trauma, who were on progesterone, recovered quicker than women who weren't on progesterone. Well, progesterone was already a, a generic drug. So no drug company was gonna do anything with it because there's no money to be made in a generic drug. You, you weren't gonna get the trials that so it took about 10 years to get the phase three clinical trials on progesterone. Progesterone given to a patient with head trauma with TBI within six hours of, of, of the head trauma, supposedly they recovered better than people who weren't on progesterone. They got about a third of the way through using Glasgow coma to stratify the patient population, and they had to, the FDA had to abandon it because of futility because Glasgow coma wasn't, you know just wasn't good enough to make a determination whether the progesterone was working or not. So we don't know really whether progesterone works other than anecdotally we see that women who are on progesterone seem to recover from head trauma a lot quicker. What about Tegretol? Sorry? Tegretol. It hasn't been approved yet. Neuron? There are compounds out there. That's why it's going to be so important because now I'm going to be able to stratify the patient population you're going to be able to take these drugs. You're going to know that the FDA accepts that these people have traumatic brain injury to this degree, and you're going to be able to test these drugs and know the effect of the drugs on the patients. That's, that's how this de-risks it. It's important that the patient knows that they have it. That's what we want to know. But what's even more important is that you can get better treatments, and that's how you get better treatments. That's how you de-risk it for the drug companies. You get yourself in a position where, in fact, you can stratify the patient population. You can't with Glasgow Coma. Glasgow Coma, for those of you who have any familiarity with it, was, was really a, a disability form. It was used by insurance companies to determine how disabled somebody was, whether or not they could go to work or not. You know, 
the they had an attention span long enough to go to work. That, that's how it was used. But it is the only FDA approved diagnostic for that. Traumatic brain injury diagnosis in DOD since September 11th, 2001. 2.8 million Americans go to emergency rooms every single year suffering head trauma. So, so the number is huge. So as I entered into this, I mean, these are the 2.8 million people like you who were in car accidents. Um, old guys like me, I went home one day and I had no. I used to have four or five ladders in my place. My wife had taken them and given them to the Goodwill. She said, you might get up on a ladder again because I hear about all these old guys falling on the ladder. Smart. You know? <laughs> so I, I don't get up on ladders anymore. Okay? Bicycles. Huge number of individuals have head trauma with bicycles. It just falls. As, 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 you know, people get older, you know? You have people who are 85, 90 years, they lose their balance, they fall. They have head trauma. The, the, the greatest increase we're seeing is in people over the age of 65, because we're seeing so many more people are living over the age of 65, 75, even 85, that they're having an opportunity to have head trauma. So it, it's a huge issue. Huge issue. We're talking about the, uh, another question about the medical research part. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to understand the models, and I, I'm slowly coming around to understand the complaint you have about research. It's different models of different sciences. And it so, is. So physics, I'm not, I'm not that familiar with all. Physics, physics is fantastic. But it's, it's organized. There are big teams that do things. You can get the Nobel Prize by being the head of the big team or being part of it. Everybody points to physics is where we want to go. Yeah, and medical research is this individual, individual, I'm hiding my stuff from you because I, I don't want you to steal my, yeah. my, my overall profits. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, you just got to get the reverse. And part of the problem is it's the government uh, in the sense that it has to be organized in some way. And this, I'm, not the, I'm not a historian of science, but there's big machines involved. The government pays for the machines. They, they organize how they're going to get used. And so that brings the big teams together because you want you can't do your work unless you use one of these machines. And they, Genome sequence. Yeah. Genome sequencing was one of them. The sequence. Yeah, so you need the way to, to organize. The, the demand side has to be different. The supply side is all fragmented. To get something out, you need the demand side. And I don't see that necessarily happening. Yeah, I just wish we pull the pull the universities together, you know, the top 20, 25 universities. I wish we pull the government together. I wish we pull the NIH together, and I, and I wish they would sit down and have a conversation like we had uh, four years ago. We posted a white paper on it, where you sit everybody in a room and you say, okay, these are these are the inefficiencies that are out there that are causing us not to be as efficient as we possibly could with the money we're spending. How can we get at these? What can we do? I'm not saying blow up the system. I, I, I'm really not. But, but, but I'm saying, how can you kind of implement the Paul Allen model? And, and you're right. You're sort of, you're missing, uh, you, you, in our private talk, we talked about AIDS. And, and this is like a moment, political moment, to do this. And it should have happened. The DOD should have done more. The government should have done more in the early 2000s when they were was public interest in it more than there is now. Even though it's widespread in the, uh, through accidents, there was a concentration of concern about soldiers. And you, you responded to that. But there, the medical people should have done something else. They that. should have. They should have. But my, my, my docs are a, 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 they're a product of the same, my military doctors are a product of the same educational system that, that you'll all go through. You won't be military doctors. You'll be, you know, they, they understand how they have to progress in the field. If, if you go to the head 
department or you know the head of neurology at, at UCLA and look up what they're looking for in a job description, it'll start out with publications. First author, last author. In what publications? And it rank orders of publication. What's the number one publication to get published in that probably makes your career? Nature. You get published in Nature as the first author, you are, you are, you're doing very, very well. Now, biologists have gotten around that problem. They change the first letter in the alphabet every single year. One year, the first letter in the alphabet is A, and then all the authors on their papers are published in alphabetical order beginning with A. The next year, the first is B, and they're all. That's how they have, have totally, you know, desensitized and make you know unimportant where you are on an article. But, but you know, and you guys have heard it, first author, last author, buried in the middle. And one of the slides I show when I show in front of medical groups, that quite frankly, I show it in front of my army buddies, they go, why is that important? It's a slide with Jeff Manley, who, who doesn't call himself a PI of this 100 scientists, because he understands that with PI comes a certain amount of, of, of baggage. You know, principal investigator. He won't call himself the PI. <clears throat> he calls himself the contact PI. He's the guy you call if you want to know something about the study. And he puts his name in the middle of every single piece that they publish. And he allows the young folks that are working for him to put their name at the front and their name at the end. He puts his name in the middle because he understands the system that they have to grow up in right now until it can be changed. Well, at the same time, he wants to advance the science. So it's, it's really interesting. When I put up the slide with Jeff Manley's name in the middle, and I have it highlighted in front of a, at an academic conference, everybody goes up to Jeff and says, what, what are you doing? This is your baby. Why are you putting your name in the middle? Mm -hmm. That's right. <clears throat> Any other questions? Well, I really appreciate the opportunity. I wish I wish I had a few more questions, but if you don't have questions, that's okay. I really appreciate the opportunity to come and speak to all of you. And I wish you the best of luck. You couldn't be at a better institution. And as far as I'm concerned, um, I, I want to attract all the talent we can to this particular field of cognitive studies because I, I think it's so important. Um, I would encourage you to think about open science. I encourage you to you know, look into it a little bit more, understand it a little bit more. Uh, I would encourage you to work with multidisciplinary teams. Um, I mean, the, the stuff that the Allen Institute is doing is not based on hi hiring a whole bunch of neurologists, psychiatrists, you know. Um, it, it's based on putting together multidisciplinary teams. I think the Allen Institute has more engineers than it, than, than it has um, neurologists working the brain because they really believe that it, it takes an engineer background to understand you know, the circuitry, the construction of the brain. Uh, and it's, a, it's an amazing thing to watch these teams break down the silos between their different disciplines and work together to solve a really difficult problem. And that, that, that's what I think we have to do. We, we, we've got to break down the silos because you know the thing we're finding with traumatic brain injury is traumatic brain injury is, as Jeff Manley calls it, a gateway injury. We see a higher incidence of Parkinson's, we see a higher incidence of seizures, we see a higher incidence of ALS, we're seeing a higher incidence of dementia uh, and Alzheimer's. That doesn't mean because you have a traumatic brain injury that's gonna happen to you. It just means that you know chances go up. Um, and people who have one TBI are much more likely to have a second TBI than someone else is likely to have a first TBI. It's just the way it works. And I really believe the, 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 the real value of the data set we've created with these 3,000 patients, and if we're able to get the money to genome sequence all of them, is going to not only help people with traumatic brain injury, but it's going to help people which have these other diseases that are related, or it's going to spur the science forward in those areas. I want to follow your model of doing what you did with traumatic brain injury research, like the open science. Well, it's, it's tough, and what, what I'd really love to be able to do is if you really have an interest, rather than talk to a liberal arts major who spent four years in the military, is talk to uh, Jeff Manley. And I mean, he, he is just an amazing guy. 
um, or any of these researchers. Russ Safant is one of the folks at Harvard. Harvard's one of our enrollment sites. Harvard and Mass General's one of our enrollment sites. Uh, when we first uh, started the email, there were some copies of the people at Mass General, or at least the people involved with them. Yeah. So uh, later on, I'm not going to necessarily want to do it now, but the students might want to invite some of them over. Yeah, there's, there's two amazing people that um, we copied in, in on, on that where we heard that you, you were interested in this. One of them is a guy named Ross Safant. He's one of the track TDI investigators. Uh, and uh, he'd be a great guy to talk to, okay? And he's yeah. up at Harvard. But another one is Joe Giacino. Um, he is a rehabilitative uh, medicine doc uh, and works with, with stroke patients, works with uh, people with uh, uh, spinal cord injury. What's his name? His name is um, Joe Giacino. Ross Safan. They're, they're, they're really valued members of the track TBI team. Um, they'd be the guys to talk about how you do this. And I'd be more than happy to put you in contact with Jeff Mayon. Okay? My email is pretty simple. It's my name, all one word. Peter Corelli. Spell Corelli. It's spell chair, reverse the and I Add jelly, drop the J and change the light off. <laughs> it's really simple to remember. C H I A R E L L I. So it's Peter Corelli at me.com. That's my address. And I'll hook you up with Jeff Manley. Uh, well, I want to thank you very much. I'm so happy that you came by and explained what your organization is doing and, and educated us on, on the structure of science being one of the better barriers we have in getting. Uh, work done on this topic. Thank you very much.